yeah which finder general i watched it it's very um my i first saw it a few years ago when i was doing one of those um you know, top 100 British movies of all time, blah, blah, blah. I think it was on there. I went and rented it from the library. Um, I got confused because sometimes it was called The Conquering Worm or whatever. And I was like, okay, America. Um, and I really enjoyed it back then. And I think it kickstarted my love of the subgenre that is folk horror. Were you aware at the time that you were doing a folk horror film or is that something that's been applied to it later on? Applied to it later on. Mm -hmm. Mike Reeves, who the young director who I made all his, I was in all his movies, including mm -hmm. his little amateur ones when we were both about 15 years old. Um, he never, a lot of people think that he loved making horror movies, but he didn't at all. He had no great love of them at all, but he was awfully keen on making a, a name for himself as a successful money-making young director. And in those days, one of the ways of doing that was to make horror movies. So we made three horror movies, uh, which he didn't, I mean, he was quite proud of them all, but on a technical level, but in terms of, of the horror side of it, he quite enjoyed throwing blood around and all that. Of stuff. <laughs> but, but, but he was a serious, I'm not saying horror movie makers are not serious filmmakers, of course they are, but it wasn't a great love of his. He just wanted to be successful and make money uh, for the producers. So they would go and hand him all sorts of projects. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the movie he was planning on next uh, was from a little book called All the Little Animals, which I was not going to be in. He said, <laughs> uh, and that's not a horror story at all. It's an extraordinary, uh, um, a charming, and, and they made a, a not very good film of it with John Hurt a few years ago. But yeah, he wasn't, uh, so no, we weren't aware at all. We just knew we were making a kind of nasty, bloody, gory <laughs> uh, movie. But, <laughs> we, but folk horror, no, we did, that was that yeah. sort of yeah, that's the sort of academic sort of term to talk about yeah. it professionally now. But it's I find that so interesting because you always expect coming back to something that was made in the sort of 60s and 70s when technology and ideas and thresholds of what audiences are willing to put up with have um, expanded and changed and evolved so much. You always think you're going to be sort of um, disappointed, if you will, with the thing and of course what we always forget is that because there wasn't all of the things that we have now it often relied on story and character more so than perhaps things do now so you'll find that old movies are often better than current movies and Witchfinder General is so interesting because it's so well known for being this tour de force of like Oh, they were faint. It was the exorcist of its time, almost, it seems, from what I've read, where people are like, it was, it's ghastly, it was just disgusting, it's so awful. And much like when you, you know, pick up Madame Bovary and you're like, ha, 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 here we go, like, oh, banned literature, and there's, like, not a single sex scene, and you're like, um, what? Like, why, what? <laughs> it's similar for Witchfinder General. All of the violence that's really genuinely horrible violence like rape is off screen and the true chilling nature of the movie comes from everything around the violence and that's so clever not because of an avoidance of censorship like in Gone with the Wind where she you don't see the amputation you just see Scarlet sort of screaming in the doorway it's that there was a conscious decision to have people be there and react or more importantly, not react to the violence. And I just think that's so clever. And I just think it's a real shame um, that your poor friend and the director went so soon because I genuinely feel he was a master of his craft. Mm. I think you're quite right. I mean, it was very sad, I, I think. Um, yes. I, I I think Mike sitting if he be if he was sitting here next to me I think he'd be grinning his head off because, <laughs> I, because it's you know it's awfully it's awfully not easy what I mean is an awful lot happens between a thing being made and it being appreciated many many years later and all sorts of all sorts of sort of undeserved accolades are given to a thing which which were never even sought after when they were being made you understand mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so sometimes uh, there's a certain amount of, um, oh, gosh, look at what he did there. Well, that was an accident, and <laughs> he didn't know he'd done it at the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> I mean, we were just making, uh, uh, I mean, it was the biggest film Mike had made. It was still a very small budget. You know, he had a major American star in it. He managed to get a few lovely actors into it. Um, um, he liked the book. Um, uh, the thing about Mike and violence was that he, he was one of those people who said, violence is horrible. But the only way you tell people violence is horrible is by showing its effects. He despised, for instance, the John Wayne barroom brawl, where nobody got hurt, uh, mm -hmm. no blood. You know, people went through windows and got smacked in the face. If you if you hit somebody in the face with your fist, you'll break his cheekbones and your knuckles will smash. Yeah. And he said, you'll never see that. It's glorified. The, the violence is glorified. He said, I don't want to glorify violence. I want to make it disgusting. Now, that's what he got a lot of criticism for, because people said it was gratuitous. Yes, it was gratuitous, but his idea was to make it look horrible, you know? And it worked. It genuinely worked. And you're right, it's so interesting how in later years as, as critics, we sort of apply all these like, oh, weren't they so clever? And it, yeah. I think it's wonderful that at the time they were just like, oh, that's free. We should use that. And someone's like, yeah. the use of that was just so smart. Um, yeah. <laughs> love it. So had you been to Suffolk before? Have you ever visited before? Yes. Um, first of all, um, I was a native of Essex for a bit. Uh, from between seven and 14, I lived outside Colchester. So that's fairly nearby. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yes, I, and indeed, um, I, I'm fairly sure that Mike and his mother lived in Suffolk. I'm almost certain. I, I'm desperately trying to remember the name of the village that they lived in. And I, it's so long ago and I can't remember, but I certainly visited Suffolk. I, 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 uh, yes, sure. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Because it's one of the few films that genuinely there's so much of Suffolk in it, mm. um, which is so rare. And upon my recent findings with the, the dig that's recently come out on Netflix sort of everyone's available to talk, they only did one week of filming in Suffolk for the dig. And it's because it's sort of impossible because there's no travel lodges nearby and yeah. hard to get to. And there's lots of winding roads sort of thing. Um, but did you all stayed in, um, Barry St. Edmunds? Mm -hmm. The Angel, yeah. the Angel Hotel. I'm sure it's still there, isn't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. yes, we all stayed there. You see, here's the thing. Moving moving a film crew around is very, very expensive, as you probably mm -hmm. know. And um, they didn't have the budget for that. So once we settled on a location, we found our central spot where we could live. And then everything was found within a relatively short distance of Barry St. Edmunds, really. Um, we were lucky to get those army lands i'm not sure exactly where they were but all that horse stuff and galloping was all done on army ranges which would they had nice smooth roads but then real miles and miles and miles of forests and woods and the fields beyond it that was all very useful stuff um we had lavenham of course we had that wonderful old church and its accompanying vicarage which was mm. lovely you know um yeah I, I mean, that's why we didn't move very far. Once we got ourselves <laughs> there, we were there, yeah. Just, yeah, stay there. Um, mm. It's really lovely, though, and it's, um, again, like, I don't know whether it was on purpose or not, and lots of people talk about this now, about the movie, but it, the mixture of the, the, the horrible, horrible violence with the beautiful, sweeping Suffolk landscape is such a brilliant mix, and I think that's why the movie has lasted... Um, more so than perhaps his other horror movies, more so than perhaps mo other movies at the time. Um, and it's considered, isn't it, as the sort of one of the holy trinity of the subfolk horror genre alongside Blood on Satan's Claw and um, The Wicker Man, which is possibly the most famous. Yeah. And I don't think it's just because of Vincent Price. I think it's because the movie itself stands the test of time and holds up. I find it so mm -hmm. funny. The I think you should mention the score as well, the music score by Paul Ferris. Uh, it's very lyrical. And that lyricism going against what's actually happening on the screen is, I think, very clever, you know? It's, and again, that, that yeah. would have been down to Paul rather than to Mike. You know, I mean, Paul uh, saw this as an enormous opportunity and he spent his entire budget on an orchestra. Usually a thing like that would be he'd go, OK, how much money am I getting for the score? All right, well, I'll keep X for myself and then I'll just get like a three-piece band. So he spent every penny on a, on a full orchestra, which is why it has that very rich sound, you know? Mm. It's a bigger score than than the movie a movie like that would usually get. Yeah, and it, it brings a weight to it. And the closing yeah. moments where that sort of, the love melody comes in across the credits, after mm. Mm. Um, a truly horrible ending. Yeah, um, yeah. It's and again, see, that ending is a complete accident, you know? Yeah, there, was, there was more to the script than that. 
uh, I think I think the original script was something to do with uh, um, the witch finder goes runs away and I think he actually kills Sarah and and he go, goes and hides in a gypsy camp or something and then I catch up with him in, in a gypsy camp I don't remember but there was more <laughs> to the script than that and uh, and that ending really was a complete accident simply because we ran out of time in Orford Castle oh, another great location mm -hmm. we ran, ran out of time. And uh, and literally, Mike went back to the cutting room and he found he had this footage of, of the empty corridors just before we came in, when we were being led to our doom with our, with our hands tied. There were bits of empty corridor. And he just stuck those on at the end and then filled them full of screaming and, and you know, said, OK, that's the end of the movie. Um, again, an accident. Such a ha this is why I think he's such a master because yes, it is an accident, but there would have been there's something within him that knows that that's mm. just the right thing to do. You know when people are, can just throw a poem up out of nowhere and it's brilliant and they're just mm. like, well, I just you know pull it out of my butt like it's fine. But you're like, you have an innate talent within you, and of course the the screaming on the closing echoes the screaming on the opening, and we've come full circle. And like, if you want to start applying criticism to it, you see such a detailed clever film and i absolutely adore that it wasn't necessarily a passion project that it wasn't necessarily ever meant to be anything more than what it was mm -hmm. um everything was just accidental and thrown together at the last minute and yeah. yet I mean, yeah it, it, yeah in a sense of course it was a passion project because all of mike's movies were passion projects because he you know he he didn't really have the backing of a studio he had to try and sell them on his own merits and things so getting a movie off the ground even back then was not easy no and um so once he got it then then of course it became a passion project and of course the other thing about it, he really was he was incapable really of talking about anything other than movies i mean it was his complete life really if you didn't like movies mike Spending time with Mike Reese could be a kind of important <laughs> experience. We all love movies, and that's what we did all day, all day long. We watch movies, but um, that was his thing, and, and so everything really was a passion thing for him. But but you're right. I mean, the, the subject matter wasn't no. Yeah, I absolutely love that. He sounds so cool. He genuinely yeah. does. He sounds so much fun. <laughs> um, I was really interested as well. Um, watching it this time around, I was a little bit wary. I was like, uh oh, what's this going to be like in terms of misogyny because the subject matter is of course horribly misogynistic as is the film and yet again there are lines written in and actions made and choices made by actors that actually combat the misogyny not overly progressively for the time um not to shit on the 60s but obviously they were different times and i think i was surprised with how unoffended I was, if that makes sense. Hmm. Yes, good. good. Yeah. Again, again, unconscious. I mean, back in 1967, <clears throat> the Me Too movement wasn't around. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we all had awful attitudes, to be honest with you, that back then. Uh, all us men, you know, we really, we really did. Um, um, <laughs> I'm afraid. Uh, yes, I, I'm one of those people who, who who agrees with absolutely everything in terms of the progressive movements and all those things. But I also say, you know, it's awfully, it's awfully little unfair to judge the past by the morals and standards of today, you know. We ought to have felt like that. The fact we didn't was that we, none of us did, really. But, yeah. but you're right. I mean, I mean, you know, the Hilary Dwyer character is still a damsel in distress, and she's a strong one, but at the same time, she is still the classic damsel in distress. And, of course, all the... The witches are mostly women. Uh, but again, that was historically accurate, of course, as this, well. This um, is the thing, though. Like, I yeah. I sort of, um, I was like, that's she can be my damsel in distress. The women, the witches can majority be women, but they there was always a man there as well. They weren't yeah. the majority. It always seemed quite equal in that sense. And also, you're absolutely right, it's historically accurate, so it be silly to force something like that in and just her character was just a lot stronger and more than stronger she was sensible and I mm. think that's what I always miss in female characters when you complain about weak female characters to me it's it's them just not making sensible decisions she can be frightened she's entitled to be frightened she's entitled to have emotions absolutely it's that she was like right I'm gonna play my cards this way in this moment and 
run away at that moment. And she was just, she made good choice. She never went down to the basement. She never turned the lights off type of thing. Yeah. And so you can really root for her in a way that uh, perhaps her contemporaries in other movies, you couldn't because they would fall victim to the writing of just, and then the woman could be replaced by a lamp. <laughs> See, yeah. kind of thing. So it was, um, it was really good. And and also the sort of equality of, as the poor witch was being lowered into the fire, you also had the reaction from the sort of husband or boyfriend. So it was always, it was, it was, it was never like, we hate women. It was like right. horrible things are happening to lots of people. And everyone's just kind of semi cool with that which is horrific and that's where the horror comes from there are lots more movies today that don't intend to be misogynistic that end up being more so than these movies that are but just yeah. because of the choices that they've made in the writing and yeah, stuff yeah. so i was really pleasantly surprised because you know the all stories came from the main sort of seven tropes as it were and you can't avoid a, a damsel in distress somebody has to be in distress for the story to happen and yes that was always women and that's that's fine because it was like 1968 right. so <laughs> i mean now richard marshall would be gay and he'd be rescuing his boyfriend <laughs> how wonderful would that be yeah, that's that's really so fun <laughs> <laughs> just for a bit of representation in there yeah. um yeah because they they must have existed in the 1400s yeah, 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 <laughs> the LGBT yeah, yeah. community yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. just very secretly I guess um, yeah. <laughs> and another perfect excuse as to why they would be uh, accused of witchcraft so indeed yes, absolutely yeah can all tie yeah. it in yeah I think Cromwell would have had a hard time with it but there we go yes Cromwell is in this movie played yeah. by I want to say Richard Wayward is that wrong no it's Richard uh, Oh, what's his name? What's his name? No, my brain's going as well. Let me get on to IMDb because he's yeah. in yeah. The Blood on Satan's Claw. But yeah. he's not in The Wicker Man. Right. Um, so he doesn't quite hit the... Patrick Weimark. Weimark. Patrick Weimark. Patrick, not Richard, anything. Patrick <laughs> Weimark. He, he was quite a big uh, television star and movie. He did quite a lot of films as well. That was that they might manage to get <clears throat> two or three people in little tiny roles. The other one was Wilfred Bramble, who's playing the old shepherd in the most outrageous performance in the world. He was there for literally for a morning from about 8 o'clock in the morning to we finished with him by 11 or 12 or something. But he got billing because he was a big television star at the time. Oh. Same with Patrick. And um, who else did we get, manage to get little, little tiny parts? I don't think, I think I was it in terms of cameos, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yes. Well, I mean, Mark said we can't do the Battle of Naseby because we haven't got the budget. So what we'll do is we'll do after the Battle of Naseby. <laughs> we'll around having lunch. We can do lunch. We can't do the Battle of Naseby. <laughs> it's clever. It's you know, it works because you, yeah. <clears throat> you know, you get it. It's, it's so well written. It really is like, you can't fault it for that. Um, yes. Well, a lot of that's got to do with Tom Baker, you know, his writing partner. Mm. Um, Tom was terrific and they'd been school friends and uh, Tom was a sweet dear man. He, you know, he was a very quiet, unassuming chap, but he, he and Mike worked very, very well together. And um, a, a lot of that we, input was from Tom. I don't know which bit was Tom or which <laughs> bit was Mike. An awful lot of it was Tom, I would suspect. Mm. <laughs> Amazing. I hadn't realized it was based on a book until literally today when I got to Wikipedia. So. Yes, yes. Ronald Bassett, it was right. Well, it wasn't a big bestseller, but it did all right, I think. And mm. and I think Mike was looking around for projects, and this one came landed on his on, or he found it, or I don't really I don't remember. But he found it, and oh, that would be good, a historical piece. Yeah, sure, you know. Yeah. Could see, yeah, it caught his imagination. He thought we could do stuff with that. Yeah. Definitely. It is it is really interesting how the narrative is is tipped between it's it's not panto in that you don't spend time with the lovers and then you go to the villain and it's heightened emotions it's sort of both parties are working equally towards their end goal and then against each other and that's so interesting to sort of follow the interwoven stories right. yes it's true it's true i mean i'm sometimes asked by fans of the movie what was it like to work with vincent pride mm. and i say i don't know i don't know because <laughs> if you look at the movie i have two scenes with really <clears throat> at the very beginning of the movie, at the very end, we have parallel stories. Yes. But we only really meet 
the end, beginning and end. <clears throat> yeah. So. Yeah, sorry. No, I wasn't going to ask you that because I thought, well, <laughs> doesn't it look a mess in really? <laughs> Might have yeah. shared a coffee break with him or heard a story yeah. from somebody well, I else. mean, we were in the same hotel and, of course, we all have dinner together and he'd tell funny stories at the bar. And, he, and I mean, I knew him quite well. It's just we didn't work together much, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when he was working, I'd get him my little mini <clears throat> and I'd zoom back to London, you know, as uh. fast as possible because, you know, I mean, Barry St. Edmunds and the, and, the, and the Angel Inn, the Angel Hotel were lovely, but I, you know, go home, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, could get some heating and running water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I think that's... Oh and Vincent was in his element, of course, in, in Barry St. Edmunds, because when he wasn't working, he'd just go around all the antique shops, because he was a oh. great uh, collector, you know, and uh, he, he bought tons of stuff and shipped it back to America. And, yeah. oh, amazing. Yeah. I always forget that he's American. I don't know why. I think because his voice is just... It's not an accent. It's Vincent Price speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's always a shock to me whenever he opens his mouth, even though you know what Vincent Price sounds like. It's so grating is the wrong word because that makes it sound like it's bad, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's great. I can't do it. I can't do it at all. I have people who that, but I can't do his voice. <laughs> no, I don't think I, I think I need to smoke some more cigarettes before I do, yeah, yeah. do it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I guess have you visited Suffolk since just to bring Suffolk back? Same thing. Trying to think, been to Norfolk, of course, been to Norwich uh, um, several times. Um, Norwich being a major touring city for when you're doing plays. Yes. I'm not sure uh, Suffolk has got Ipswich, hasn't it? Has it got a yeah. bit of it? We've got two. We've got the Regent and the Wolsey, which sometimes take touring companies. Right. But not so much as if if you're only coming to this side of the country once, you'd go to Norwich. Yes, that's right. That's right. So that's why I don't think I have really visited again. It's odd. I went back to my, I took my American wife back to my childhood home in Copford, which is just outside Essex. Um, and it and it was extraordinary. I've never been back since. And and, and to go and see a place you, had, you that you remember from last time you were there, you were about 14. Mm -hmm. And I've lived there for seven years. And how small it had become, you know? Yes, of course. <clears throat> yeah. But, uh, but that's as close as I can say I got to. I've been getting to Suffolk, I think, recently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fair. I just like it. I mean, I mean, it's a lovely. The thing about back then, when when I was young, is that the East Anglia was not that easy to get to. There were no motorways back then. It's still I'm not that easy to get to. Though. Yeah, and it's a it's a pig to get to, but but it's easier now, isn't it? An ish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you, what's your favorite memory from the movie? Um, I. I I've always been a rider, so I quite enjoyed all my horse scenes. I liked it. He was an impossibly difficult horse to ride. <laughs> he was very, very big and very, very strong, and he loved to run really fast. <laughs> and once he got going, he was almost impossible to stop. Uh -huh. So I would say to Mike, I need another half mile beyond the end of line, because he's just a killer. <laughs> he had a mouth of iron, and, and but he was terrific, and he was tireless. He just would pound on and on and on. Oh. So I liked all that. <clears throat> um, I never liked being in horror movies very much. I mean, I did several. Uh, I worked for Amicus. I've done, you know, I did a couple of movies for Amicus as well. And I never liked doing horror movies very much because I don't like looking frightened. I don't like acting. <laughs> I'm, I'm what they, you were too I'm what dashing they, to keep yeah. distorting your face in fear. <laughs> yeah, I'm what used to, they used to call my style of acting light comedy. I used to, I'm a light comedian in the sense that I drawing room comedies, you know, yes, cigarette, sort of... martini, and one arm up on the mantelpiece. That's the... some sort <laughs> so, of reaction. So the, whole horror, I, the whole fear horror side of it, I never really enjoyed very much, but I did enjoy the action sequences. Uh, they were nice and fun, and, and uh, I loved working with Mike because he mm. was. I think I wrote about him, but that, that he was one of those directors who always said he knew nothing at all about acting or acting or how they did it. So he said, all I can do is cast it right. And I hope for the best. He said, because I, the, the most directing Michael ever said is, he said to me, could you do it a bit quicker? Or do you have to run like that? <laughs> and I said, like what? He said, like a, like a, like a, like a gay chicken. He said, <laughs> uh, but, but, but with Vincent, of course, he, it's no, it's a well-known thing about with Vincent is because he never wanted Vincent. He wanted mm. Donald presence in the part. And Vincent came along and um, Vincent thought that he was going to do another of his wonderful Edgar Allan Poe, eye-rolling, Mask of the Red Dead, Fall of the House of Usher performances, which were camp and grotesque and large, but great fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And Mike said, no, 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 this was a real character. I want you to be real. I want you to... And that's why 
a lot of people say this is one of Vincent's best performances because of my, yeah. my all my direction was in the negative. Please don't do that. Please don't. <laughs> So Vincent didn't like that very much. Yes, but, that's uh, fair. It is interesting, isn't it? It's it's his greatest performance because it's his only non-performance, if you will. Yes. I mean, he just he toned it down, and, and mm. the toning down made it more, I think, much more effective. I mean, he could have done his eye rolling and his... Absolutely. I mean, I watch Theatre of Blood every Halloween, and it's marvellous, but um, mm. there's something more sinister in this is because it's proper film acting. I find film acting impossible because I'm a face maker, <laughs> and I can't... Yes, well, we're, we're not allowed to do anything. I mean, I have to say, Emily, that, that I've only recently discovered how to act in movies, and I'm very <laughs> old, you know? <laughs> uh, the trick is to do absolutely nothing and let the audience you know, make, make their own judgments on it. And nothing on the inside either, because I was always told you're a very loud thinker, like we can see your thought process. I'm like, yeah, oh, no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is wonderful on stage, but terrible on screen. Um, but yeah, impossible. Um, yeah. yeah, any other sort of stories, I guess? Uh, <laughs> My mum realised who I was about to talk to um, about five minutes before I logged on to Zoom. She was like, Wait, is that Ian? Is that is that the set? I was like, yes, yes, it's good, it's good. And she's like, oh, I was like, oh god. Okay. <laughs> say, say hi from me. I will. <laughs> <laughs> any, other, any other memories or stories about it? Um, no, not really. Um, I remember how uncomfortable it was a lot of the time. Um, Mike never had the budget for sort of lovely big trailers or anything like that, mm. and we were expected to do nearly all of our own stunt work. Um, when I say stunt work, I mean action, really, you know. Yeah. Actors, actors who say they do, they do their own stunts mostly are lying. <laughs> they're not allowed to, you know. The insurance company won't permit it. But what they do is their own, their own action. And if you can ride a horse, then you're expected to ride a horse. But, but quite as fast as I was riding it, and, you know, and <laughs> yes. um, that kind of thing. And, and um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 for instance, I remember being appalled when I saw, when I went to, I wasn't in that particular scene, the burning scene in Lavenham mm -hmm. with the lowering of the witch. No, that was Mike's idea. I don't think anybody ever did that in real life. I think that was just a nasty thought that he had. Let's do a different kind of burning. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was incredibly dangerous. In fact, she got burnt slightly because the wind changed. As they were lowering her, the wind changed, the flames were very high, and the wind suddenly changed direction and blew at her. Now, she wasn't bad. It was, it was, she had um, a mask and you know, flame proof clothes, but she had makeup on her hands where the blood was around her wrists where the rope was. Mm -hmm. And that actually bubbled and that, that burnt her. But the actual, <laughs> yes, it wasn't hospitalized, but you know, it, it, she got a hurt. scar and from that. Very, yes. very dangerous stunt. I mean, some idiot could let go of that rope and she'd be a goner. Well, yeah. yeah. And I think that's why those movies from those days are so <laughs> interesting to watch because you know, I mean, I watched Logan's Run the other day for my podcast and we talked about a scene where Michael York and Jenny Agatha are just hit by water and they are hit <laughs> and they are thrown to the floor and you're like, that happened. They did that. Yes. That's a real thing. If you ever get a chance, I mean, look at a movie called The Last Voyage. Oh, okay. Um, with uh, Robert Stack and Dorothy Malone. It's, a, it's not a very big budget movie, but it's about the sinking of a, of a line of a ship. And the director, whose name I can't remember, Andrew, Andrew, what is name? He, he, he and his wife made these movies together. And it, it's extraordinary because they actually had a real ship. They, they've got this ship that um, the Japanese had bought for the, from the Americans for scrap, and it was in Tokyo Harbor, I think, and he said, I want to use that. So then, okay. So what he did was he kept sinking the ship and then pumping it out and bringing it back up. It's a full-size ship. And there's a, there's, a, there's a point in the movie where Robert Stack is, un, is, is below decks, and he opens a porthole, and the, and the water comes through, or, or in, a, in a blast, and he pushes, and when he gets up, his face is a mask of red. That's blood. That's his own blood. Because the porthole hit him on, in the face and cut him wide open. Ooh. There's bits where Edmund O'Brien is in it, and apparently uh, uh, Edmund O'Brien uh, uh, hit the director at one point because because he hadn't told him the ship was going to sink underneath him. <laughs> and it, the whole thing, movie, it's like it's extraordinary film because the whole thing shot on the ship, slowly disintegrating. And it's a and it's a wonderful, I think it's a terrific movie. Um, his best. Or the last one. Yeah, yeah. That's so Make interesting. Titanic looks silly. Yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> and they, there's so many of them, wasn't it? The White Star yeah. or whatever they were called. They had like three ships and they all sunk. So there's millions of movies out there to be made about yeah. sinking no, ships. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting because I'm such a one for being like, I fundamentally hate when these asshole directors feel the need to slap their actors to get a reaction out of them and shake them. And that's another thing I was going to say. I was so happy after watching Michael York shake Jenny Agatha for so long, I was so pleased that not once did you shake Sarah to sort of snap her out of it. And I was like, oh, thank God, none of that. She's bigger than me. (laughs) (laughs) Take you out. Um, But she she was quite a big girl, Hillary. She and, died last year, you know. Oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I was really happy. My old mate Nick, Nicky Henson. I mean, we lost quite a few last year. Yeah. 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 It's really no, sad. yes, I agree. I mean, I mean, Mike, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a memory. You know, you know the little scene in the church where I do my oath, where I take my oath with my sword and all that. And Mike said to me, he said, Do you think this is gonna work? I went, why? What do you mean? He said, I'm he said, I think it's cheesy. I said, you wrote it. He said, I know, but he said, I'm getting very worried about it because I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's going to be believable. I think he said, I'm just not, I'm a bit uncomfortable about it. I said, well, why don't we just shoot it and we'll see how it works. Right? And so he did it. Mike went, okay, I think that might work. And he kept it in. But he he had his own, he had his own doubts about his own writing sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. particularly about scene like he was fine if he was hitting people or <laughs> riding a horse. But, Red paint anything, everywhere. <laughs> Yes, anything of a sort of strangely emotive stuff. He, you know, yeah. It's so interesting because I, I do have a note here to say that wedding scene is so genuine and sweet and such mm. a lovely break. Mm. Um, and it again, it, it just brings the audience into those two characters' story and makes you root for them even more. And her performance as well, where she's just constantly like, what the, f- why are you putting... Oh, what is happening? And, and then she realizes you're having yeah. a, a wedding or whatever. It, it's and yeah. it's so short, and it's so again, it's just him being cleverer than I think he perhaps realized he was. Just yeah, he I knew it needed right. a beat there to bring it down, so you could bring it up again, and and it worked so perfectly, and your performances worked so perfectly. I mean, your screen presence, just to like fan a bit, your screen presence is so charming and endearing and the second you know it's such a horrific opening even to today's standards and the second you came on screen you you bring this sort of like pull with you and instantly you're like I'm gonna root for this guy like before you've even said anything do you know what I mean you've just had one of those faces um (laughs) attractive (laughs) endearing I don't know (laughs) but yeah yeah so it's 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 really great I was going to ask you if you knew how to ride a horse beforehand because that's the one thing. Is yes. Actors are well, again, that famous was, that for was lying. Story. Well, that was <laughs> yes. when we were, when we, my sister and I were little. It was one of those things, you know, that you did. I mean, I was very lucky. I was quite privileged. I had a fairly well-off upbringing, you know. And um, where we lived in Copford uh, was rented. We didn't buy it. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, in those days, you could rent quite large houses for it. Well relatively little money. And one of the things you did, two things you did, you learned to play tennis, which I never did, and you learned <laughs> to ride a horse. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was riding a horse at eight. So uh, my happiest memories on film have been on horses. Uh, when I was, I was in an enormous movie called Waterloo, about the Battle of Waterloo with Rod Steiger and Christopher Plummer. And uh, I spent my entire time on a horse on this enormous battlefield. Lovely, I you know, didn't have to walk anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I've always liked horses. Uh, yes, I, I've ridden all my life. Yeah, yeah, it's so useful. Uh, despite growing up in the countryside, I've, I don't think I've ever been on the back of a horse, and the thought absolutely yeah. terrifies me. And at drama school, they're constantly like, "Do not say you can ride a horse if you cannot ride a horse, because that is yeah. how actors die." <laughs> that's true. That's um, true. A young, a young drama student friend of mine uh, once sent me his resume when he was just leaving drama school. What did I think of his resume? And it was a pack of lies, of course. And at the end of it, uh, in, it said skills. It said champion hang glider and I said Toby really are you are you really he went, no I've never done it in my life I said then you're an idiot I said one day they'll ask you to do it and you've never done it yeah I mean Nikki had never Nikki had not ridden a horse and he went off and had riding lessons before it started which was sensible of him but mm-hmm. um yeah yes <laughs> don't put things on your resume you can't do it it's just, yeah. you will get caught out in the worst you way will. possible you will, absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah but, but but again, it's also also a very good idea to have as many strings to your bow as you can. You know? mm, Do as many things as you can, yeah. yeah. Barista, gymnast, 
singing yeah, yeah. all of the language go. languages are so useful again yeah. something i'm absolutely awful at but, but now we're <laughs> the EU, i wonder i wonder you know, we used to be able to go abroad and but not the, i have to say I, I in all those days of the eu i never did actually work abroad you know but you uh, had you know. the potential to yeah, and, you could, you know. exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. so are you a dual citizen now with the uk and the us or just yeah. primarily us yes dual citizenship yeah i became an american in that in 2020 i argue that i'm more american than most americans because i actually had to work at it they all have to <laughs> They, they're just born, you know, yes. and they're I'm proud to be an American. What are you proud of? I said, your mum and your dad had, went to bed together. That's, yeah. that's what, you know, I said, that took me a long time to get my citizenship. It's not mm -hmm. easy. Once you get it, it. You get two passports. Welcome home, Mr. Ogilvy, in both countries. It's lovely. It's a, it's a very nice feeling to be able to have two passports. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. In such um, great, well, great now, um, mm -hmm. getting there for America after the blip that was the yeah. last four years. Have you had your vaccine yet? <clears throat> oh, no. No, I'm far too young and unimportant. <laughs> I only work in a school. Nowhere. Right. I'm, not a, I'm not a key worker. I only, you know, help children. <laughs> right. <laughs> Don't be silly. Yeah. With, with this government? It'll come. It'll come, I think. <laughs> yeah. They're around and they're being put out. But, you know, we're at that time of year where we should have gone into lockdown this time last year. And then we would have zero cases because we have no excuse because we're in an island. Oh. But unfortunately that doesn't make anyone any money so that yeah, wasn't an option no, 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 no. Um, very sad isn't it yeah such a shame yeah well um, my wife has got my wife has got covid arm from hers ooh. you should look up covid arm it's quite it's it's a harmless it little gruesome? no it's not it's just it's a bit of a rash and it comes later it comes like two weeks after you oh. have it all of a sudden she's got a sore arm and it's a bit swollen and she's got a bit of a rash Ooh. So, COVID arm. You can COVID arm. <laughs> well, it's just it's in the arm. arm it'll go away. Mm. It's so interesting. Yeah, hopefully it'll go away and not become long COVID arm. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. I just want to talk to you for the rest of the day, but you probably haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of anything fun more that you might like to know about which one. Um, yes. And um, if you ever want to come on my other podcast to talk about a movie from your childhood, please. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> what are you, the movie one remembers? Yes, it's something you either watched a lot or you haven't watched since or something that you just remember that you used to mm -hmm. watch when you were a kid. And um, I need to sort of branch out more generation-wise. Right. Because right. um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a lot of... E.T. and the Goonies. That yes, I but, then you're, but then your, but then your, your, your audience won't know what the hell anybody. If anybody's too old and talking about a movie from their dim and distant past, nobody's going to know what they're talking about. No, I love it. I love that you'll go from E.T. to Citizen Kane to then Zulu back to you right. know, Indiana Jones or whatever. Because it, it, if you have loyal listeners, they will listen to every episode and then you introduce people to new movies. I couldn't wait to rewatch Logan's Run. Uh, with the guy last night we ended up talking for five hours i promise i won't keep you for five hours <laughs> um because it yeah we you know we put it to rights because it doesn't make sense even though it's a wonderful movie so um so yeah if if you ever want to do that i would absolutely love to have you and um mm, yeah cool. and i will watch the last voyage as well yeah try that one because if, mm. if it's available I, i'm not saying it's a great movie it's just that it's just that I always, it was one of Mike Reeves' favorite, by the way. Mm -hmm. oh. If you want to know the two movies, he liked that one. He loved The Killers, the one with Lee Marvin and and Kluger, the last movie Ronald Reagan ever made, called The Killers with, yeah. with Lee Marvin and Ronald Reagan and Angie Dickinson and John Cassavetes. That was that Mike Reeves thought that was the greatest movie ever made. Wow, Don Siegel, Don Siegel movie. It was actually a TV movie, really. Ooh, but Liam we used Walker. to see that. He would run that over and I've seen, must have seen The Killers 10, 15 times because he would run it all the time. Oh. That was his favourite movie. <clears throat> and he loved The Last Voyage. Um, and almost anything that Don Siegel did because he knew Don Siegel. Um, uh -huh. When he was young, he ended up with Don Siegel in Don Siegel's house in Hollywood. Uh -huh. And he, he sort of did a few little jobs for Don Siegel. So Don Siegel was his hero, really. Um, and The Killers was made way before Don Siegel became... A household yes, name. He was still yeah. making low budget movies. Yeah, so that's another one that would be. Oh. See if you like that one. Mm. Yeah. What would your um, suggestions be? What are your favourites? Well, I agree with the Killers. Mm -hmm. I, I think the Killers is is great. Um, it is a wonderful movie. I haven't seen it for a long time. Um, I, I I think I think all movies should have spaceships in them. 
<laughs> and explosions. I've got a little, um, I've got a little funny little book out at the moment, which you can get online called Withering Slights, um, which is my my take on on movies that my wife and I we don't I, I haven't done it for months now because we can't go out, but we, she and I would go to the movies two or three times a week. And if, it would, and if it tickled my funny bone, I would write a piece on it. Amazing. And some lovely man in England said, I want to put this into, make this into a book collection. So he collected them all up and it got published this year by him privately. And it's called Withering Slights. And it's published by um, a little tiny ind independent publishing company called Spiteful Puppet. Anyway, it's got most of my, my, my it's got a lot of my uh, movie reviews in there. It's supposed to be quite funny, I think. Anyway. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> I, so I, I, I often say, I know movie's worth watching unless it's got a spaceship in it. That's fair. I, yeah, I'm more of a sword and sorcery girl myself, so. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's disgraceful that I'm not cerebral enough. <laughs> yeah. mm. But I don't, I, I'm beginning to hate the superhero movies. My oh. stepsons, my American stepsons, uh, uh, who are, you know, adults and, and by easy, good adults, um, they they are experts on the whole Marvel universe. I mean. And we are watching uh, WandaVision at the moment. Have you got um, that over there? I, yeah. I don't it's... understand it. I don't get it. Because they, is... they said, you have to know who Vision is. You have to know who Wanda is. You have to know who these characters are in the movies and in the Marvel universe. And mm. so I, I find that if I have to do homework to be able to watch something or understand it, you haven't achieved in your task. And Marvel was so groundbreaking back in 2008 when they released Iron Man. And then in 2012, when they released The Avengers, it was genuinely so it, so exciting. I was at the cinema with everybody else at midnight. And I was like, this, and then, and then when Endgame came out and I yeah. did the back-to-back -back cinematic, I was like, this is cinematic history. This is, <laughs> nothing like this has ever been done before. This has been 10, 20 years in the making. This is absolutely insane. And then I was like, and it's over now, but right, then right, it right. kept going. And so with WandaVision, I've seen right. things on Twitter because people post spoilers all the time, how you have to remember that someone in Ant-Man exactly. couldn't do a card trick and now he can and like that's enjoy. And you're like, come on, man. Like it's got it's got more Easter eggs than Easter. It really has, you know. <laughs> yes. and, and you have to know what they all are. And that's and exhausting. It's kind of my head. Whoosh, you know. yeah. Even before that started coming out, there was something where there was the Agents of Shield television program. And if you hadn't seen American Captain America, the Winter Soldier, when it came out that Thursday in cinemas, that Saturday, Agents of Shield would spoil it for you. Yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. like, Yo, I can't keep up. Like, I don't have the capacity to stay on top of the Marvel Cinematic Universe as much as you want me to. Like, it's hard enough going every year to keep up on Harry Potter. Like, now you're telling me that I have to, like, tune into every tiny little... Me like, listen to this podcast, watch this television show. Otherwise, you won't know what's going on. And like everything, the fan bases, um, like Star Wars, like mm. television programs, the fan bases really ostracize others if you don't have the correct knowledge or the right opinion or yeah. you want more diversity and they're like how dare you want more women in this and you're like yes yes <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah. then yeah. Yeah. yeah no it's exhausting yeah yeah, yeah. all right cool thank you so much have let you, me know if you, you have you got enough there emily yes yes i've been recording um i hope it's recorded <laughs> <laughs> what um, do you do you edit it then or you just leave it clean? yeah i'll edit it through i might bleep out my swearing i'm going to try not swearing for this one see how that goes i'm not very good at it but we'll see um and then so the the podcast launches next friday but it'll be an episode about the dig then it'll be an episode about the Anglo-Saxons in Suffolk, and then it will be Witchfinder General. And then later on, I'll come back to it and look at the history of witch hunts in East Anglia. Right, um, right, if right. you know anything about that. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my other podcast, I've just done my 100th episode, and then it's coming back again next week, starting with Pokemon 2. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, wow. <laughs> the movie so you're, you're eclectic if nothing i love it um but yeah. yeah so i'll let you know when it's out um if you have social media channels and you want to push it but there's no pressure to do that at all um uh, but yeah thank no. you so much thank you well, it was very nice thank you very really much and, to meet you. and good luck with it all all right thank you thank you very much all have right. a lovely rest of your day you too okay bye -bye. thanks bye now bye-bye